The theory of equality of opportunity takes, uh, is based upon an ethic, and the ethic says that a good income distribution, a just income distribution, uh, rewards people according to their effort and not according to circumstances which are beyond their control. In other words, income should be sensitive to how hard people try, but it should not be sensitive to characteristics of people that they have no control over. The main characteristic of a person over which he or she has no control, but in almost all economies tremendously influences his income, is the kind of family the person was born in. If you're born to a poorly educated family that doesn't have much wealth and can't provide you with much resource, you end up not making very much income. So the income distribution is very sensitive to the education and the resources of the family that raised the person. In a society with equality of opportunity, that distinction is not important. That is to say, people end up getting much more closely uh, as associated with how hard they try and they're compensated effectively for differences in their circumstances such as the family they grew up in. So what can a developing country do to attempt to equalize the opportunities, that is to say, to make it the case that family background is less a cause of income than how hard a person works, I think the main thing they can do is compensate children who come from families that are uneducated and have low amounts of resources. That can be done in a number of ways. First of all, there has to be a very good educational system. At the first level, it has to be a good elementary school educational system, and then a good secondary school educational system. And it has to be assured that children go to school. So there, have to be, there probably have to be incentives for parents to send their children to school, poor parents, and not send their children to work. One way that's done is by these programs which have been done very effectively in Latin America like Bolsa Familia, which give resources to the children when they're in school, such as food, they feed the children, and they provide them with clothing, and they provide them with health checkups. And these things are all really uh, subsidies of poor families, but they have the incentive then to send their children to school because that's where the family gets the resources. Another thing is to have a good national health service which provides universal health care and takes care of children, which families don't have to pay for. That should be provided by, by na national insurance. So the provision of various kinds of public goods which facilitate the education uh, of children. That's, uh, I'd say, probably the most important thing. In European countries, they collect something between 40 and 50 percent of the national income in taxes and these taxes are used for uh, public goods, social insurance, transfer payments, education, health care. Every country in Europe has national health care of some sort. Uh, so it's certainly possible to have high tax collection even when the country remains capitalist. I think you have to have a dynamic understanding of what's going to happen to human society. First of all, the population is going to fall. By the time, by the time we reach a state in which everybody in the country has the level of technology of Britain or the United States, the population is going to be much smaller than it is now. Why? Because population is falling in all the advanced countries. That is to say, the highly educated people are having fewer children. Uh, even in the Catholic countries, Europe and the, the, the lowest fertility of women in Europe is in the Catholic countries. It's far below the level necessary, necessary to reproduce the population. The main accomplishment which lowers uh, women's fertility, the number of children women have, is education of women. Because when women become educated, they want to join the labor force and they don't want to spend their time, all their time raising children. So the country, the part of the world that's growing fastest now, population-wise, 
is Africa, where the women are least educated. And that is going to be a problem, but to the extent that women become educated in Africa, population growth is going to fall. So first of all, we're going to have fewer people. Second of all, the technology is constantly improving. And, co and we've never had a problem. I mean, the level of nutrition of people in the world has steadily increased over the past 300 years. Even though population has grown, it's now over 7 billion people. I don't know what it was. I don't remember what it was two or 300 years ago. It was probably le less than 1 billion or something like that. It's grown hugely in the last several hundred years, world population. But nutrition is much better than it was. So we've never had a Malthusian crisis where the population outgrows the amount of food available. Agricultural productivity has grown tremendously. We have in the United States something like 1% of our population is producing more than enough food to feed the whole United States. A lot of our agricultural produce is exported. In 1700, half the population was needed to support the food needs of all the country. So I think technological progress in, uh, uh, in food production, but also in other things, technological progress, the education of women, the lowering of population growth is going to make it possible to feed uh, everybody and at a growing average standard of living. I think uh, human development is actually good for everybody, not just uh, the poor people, and I don't think there's going to be a resource crisis. I mean, the, the short-term problem of cooperating in order to control carbon emissions is a much bigger problem. I do think that one also can be solved. I think it's a problem of cooperation. I am a socialist. I think we should try to organize our societies in a socialist way. That requires some explanation of what I mean. But I do think that markets are absolutely essential in a socialist economy as in a capitalist economy. Any complex economy, I think, needs markets. So I'm what's called a market socialist. But I also think that socialism requires much more cooperation than we have in our societies. So the answer is people will still have incentives to perform well, to become educated, so, you know, so they can earn money themselves, but also so, so they can do good for society. So for instance, in the notion of a simple Kantian equilibrium, which I've talked about, uh, people ask themselves the question in, that, in a game, in a symmetric game, where they're situated similarly to other people, instead of asking the question, what should I do to maximize my payoff, given what everybody else is doing? They ask themselves the question, what action would I like all of us to do, from my own point of view, to maximize my payoff? What would I like all of us to do? So cooperation becomes part of the action of, what, of, of how people are thinking of how they're optimizing. So let me give an example from general equilibrium theory. In general equilibrium theory, it's um, uh, touted as a positive aspect of the theory that nobody has to ever observe what other people are doing. All they have to observe is prices, and they can make all their decisions about economic choices simply by observing what prices are, and then calculating the action that will maximize their own welfare given what prices are and given what their budget is going to be. You never have to look at what other people are doing. And that's considered to be a positive aspect of the theory because it simplifies the decision. Simplifies the decision in the sense that I don't have to know much about what anybody else is doing. I just look at prices. And prices are going to coordinate this activity of all these people so we end up in a situation that has a good social outcome. In particular, it's what's called Pareto efficient. Now, in my view, people have to cooperate, and they do cooperate a lot in their actual lives. They cooperate by acting together with other people. And so the primary question people ask themselves is, what is the action I'd like all of us to take? So other people become naturally part of the action, not just part of the environment. So in classical non-cooperative general equilibrium theory, 
other people in the economic game are viewed as parameters in the environment. They're viewed as uh, inert, not as individuals who are actually part of the action. In cooperation, I think we view other people as part of the action and we want to work with them to achieve an outcome that is, that is good for all of us. Cooperation is a very important part of our economic toolkit. I don't think that as a species humans would have gotten anywhere near as far as they've gotten had we not had the ability to cooperate with each other. <clears throat> uh, so competition is uh, also uh, a part of our toolkit and an important one, but it's certainly wrong that economics has ignored cooperation, essentially ignored cooperation. It lives on the boundaries of economics and it's releg relegated to people who are considered inferior people, not economists, sociologists and psychologists, but real economists don't worry about cooperation. Uh, that's changed somewhat in recent years with the phenomenon of behavioral economics because behavioral economists talk about cooperation. What I've tried to do and what I'm continuing to try to do is to uh, have a microeconomic theory of how people can cooperate in a decentralized fashion. In other words, I don't uh, buy the distinction that competition is decentralized and cooperation has to be organized by the state. I think that by far most of the cooperation that people do happens in their everyday lives and it is decentralized. Somehow people learn to cooperate with each other. If all the cooperation we did had to be organized by the state, we'd have far less than we actually have. So cooperation is really part of the daily toolkit of a human being and in particular of an economic human being, somebody involved in economic activity. I hope that by providing a theory of how people cooperate, people, economists will learn to view cooperation as something as important as competition and they'll learn to see it in many places in real life where they have not seen it before because they don't have the tool with which to look at it. So economists are very much like a person who needs eyeglasses. Eyeglasses are the tool that help you see and the tool that helps economists see the world is game theory and general equilibrium theory. They are the tools with which economists understand what's going on. And so naturally you tend to, you tend to focus on what you can see clearly. You don't see clearly cooperation. We don't have a tool that enables us to see it. And so economists either tend to ignore it or they tend to put it to view it as a kind of competition. And they, and, they tr and they use, therefore, the tools that are used for explaining competition, namely Nash equilibrium and Valrasian equilibrium, to explain things that should really be explained in a different way. It's a different sort of an animal. It's a, cooper it's a cooperative animal rather than a competitive one. So I'm hoping that by uh, uh, writing about this theory, I will encourage young economists, who are the most impressionable, and uh, aren't uh, completely, uh, their minds aren't completely uh, distorted by the kind of education that they've had, uh, uh, to see cooperation as being uh, important in, in human economic activity.